everyone. Welcome to the We'll See You in Hell podcast. Now a part of the Fangoria Podcast Network. For more information about the network, including other programs, how to follow the show, and find past episodes of We'll See You in Hell, please visit Fangoria.com. Now, on with the show. And on with the Joe. <laughs> you said that last time too, right? I think this is my third. Oh, okay. It's our new opening, frankly. I like that you're going to... I got to think of something that rhymes with Pat. I received a single tweet where someone said they they really loved On With The Joe. So I'm, I'm doubling down. All right. Tripling down. Ah. Thrice, t- thrice you've said it, apparently. How are you doing, Pat? I'm doing good. I mean, good and bad. I, I'm, I'm waiting to hear on my, my pilot. been working on it forever. It's been a maddening experience but it is into the uh cbs network we'll see where that goes right um i gotta tell you here joe i'm not gonna say who said it i'm not gonna throw anyone under the bus but this network note process everyone knows it's difficult you've you've uh been around when i've been on some phone calls um everyone has has their say and i had to go through a production company then warner brothers then cbs for every step so every step you're getting three notes, three sets of notes from three different places. Each place has three people representing them. So it's about nine people. And this is tough stuff because, <clears throat> you know, for those of you that, that don't aren't familiar with the TV writing process, you know, one note from one person could be, could mean rewriting the script from page one. You know, but yeah. so so you're getting that many notes from that many people. God knows the chances of, of the, I mean, it's just got to be an immense amount of rewriting. Yeah, I mean, when the notes are like, hey, you know, I just had a thought, like, could you maybe swap this or whatever? And then what they either don't realize or, or don't care is that when you change that little thing that they think will take you five minutes, the entire script can fall apart. Like, because now you're later on, you're referencing that moment. Right. And it, it's not there anymore. And you have to be so vigilant about this and go through it again and again and again. This is why it's almost never good when you're sitting in a movie and the credits are rolling, the opening credits are rolling, and you see that it's been written by four to six people. Yeah, exactly. This, and then you, you're sitting there going, this doesn't make sense. And it's because right. it's, this is why. Right. And I, you know, been working on this for a long time and I feel really good about it. But it, it made it all the way up the chain to the head of CBS. He had a couple thoughts. I'm sure he did. Um, they're, they're always <laughs> going to have thoughts. They're never going to say, like, we're making it. But when he says, I have a couple thoughts, then now everyone is giving you notes, and it goes back to one again. So you have to go to production company. You go back and forth till they like it enough to pass it on to the studio. But then you got to give it to the production company first before it goes to the studio. Right. So they give you, they're like, maybe this, this, this. When it finally gets up to the studio, you're like, finally, I can relax. Then the studio has their thoughts. Then before they'll pass it to CBS, you got to send it back to the production company, then the studio, then the network again. And it just keeps going and going and going. And everyone has their thoughts, and the thoughts conflict each other. Sometimes what one person will say, I hate this. The other person will say, what happened to that? That was my favorite thing. And I, I've really reached a, something of a breaking point. And I'm going to tell you one, just one note I got, which I already told you, Joseph. Well, tell our fine audience. And, folks, I just want you to know, in case you're ever thinking about getting into television, this was a note that I received. So imagine, like, you're sitting and you, and you finish typing something, and you're like, it's, like, personal and meaningful and funny, and you're like, yes, send, finally, thank God. And then 45 minutes later, there's an email in your inbox, and it says, notes. <laughs> and they're just like, hey, this thing that you, like, read 80 times before turning in to perfect it, yeah, here's what we thought was wrong with it. And then you open the document, and they're just doing their job. I get it. But you open the document. The first note I saw, folks, and I, I was like on no sleep and kind of in a terrible mood. I also have to work full time in addition to doing this. Right. And I open it, and the first note says, here you have Leslie saying to Chip, have a good day. But Chip's only going to the mall and to church. Have a good day seems like something you would say only to somebody who was going to work. Hey. Please consider rephrasing or cutting the line. And I just picked up the phone and I was like, "Guys, this this is not gonna this is not gonna work." 
<laughs> this is not this is not a note you can send to me after we've been back and forth on this 500 times. Now who did this? Oh, you can't. I'm say. not going to tell Okay, you. I'm sorry. But I'm I was sorry. just like, this is uh, this is uh, uh, you know completely unfair. This is this is not cool. What are you doing? And I say, you know, unless Heather, my girlfriend, who I live with, unless she's going out to like get the mail and she's wearing slippers, <laughs> right. Every time she leaves the house, I say, bye, I love you, have a good day. These are the most normal things in the world. So to to pick on that, I mean, some of these notes would be like, you have him saying hi, could he say hello? And I, I tell uh, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you lose your mind. And you, you want to scream at them like, but did you did you like it? Did you know all the work <laughs> I put into this? Is it funny? Did, right, right, well, sure. Uh, so now it's it's finally into... The, the head of the head again, and now I basically have they're ba- they're all kind of like it'll probably be Monday before you hear, so now I just am am on the edge of uh, my nerves and my sanity for the next four to five days, which could even go longer if they take longer to decide. Well, I have noticed, yeah, there's been there's probably been about five different times you've said to me, finally turned in the pilot. Yeah, and each time was true. And yeah, and then like it seemed like you were ready to celebrate, and then like the next day you were like, I I can't do anything for the next five days because I gotta. I got to rewrite all this stuff again and it's it's not an easy task. I I admire that you're that you have the wherewithal to do it. I I couldn't do it. Yeah. I couldn't do it. I uh I I went to Nordstrom Rack today. Mhm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know. Yeah, I was I, mean, I was talking to my my friend Morgan who you also know about this. She had a pilot in the mix as well and she was like Look, it's in, you know. I'll I'll know what I know, but she said uh Honestly, if anybody asked me to read the pilot right now, I would show them the first draft I turned in and not the one that has gone through this, quote, perfection process. Well, sure. And that's how I felt about almost everything. I'll say in some areas, you know, certainly some of these notes were helpful and and here's something to think about and here's this and that. But I don't think great stuff comes from committee. I really do not. No, I had a a job where I did that, where I kept – I kept like my second re- or third revision of the script, yeah, and said this is the one I will send to people as a sample, yeah, uh, not the one that actually <laughs> goes on TV, yeah. Uh, it's and yeah, you, it's you, you know get, you get paid either way. It's how I look at it. I I got paid paid nicely, but then like the real kicker, and I've been in this position before, is you do all this work and you're exhausted and you're like I can't do anymore. This is it. This is everything I wanted it to be. Here we go, and they can read it on the toilet with their kids screaming and then you get a call like "Eh, it's a no hang up and then that's it yeah that can happen yeah no i know often more often than not does happen it's a it's a real disgusting business we've chosen we work i think we've probably said this before on the show we work in the most disgusting business in the most disgusting city yeah absolutely and that's not a knock on L.A. L.A. is a wonderful city. It's the it's the envi- It's the people. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the uh, you know, but it's 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 a tough scene, man. Well, look, P- Patty, let let your old friend Joe take some of your cares away tonight. <laughs> Please All right? do. Please do. It's uh, about five of twelve. Yeah. At midnight, meaning twelve. Uh, we're uh, in my my lavish apartment here, mm-hmm. uh, having a whiskey. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a Wednesday evening. We don't know when you're going to hear this, uh, but we're here and we're feeling good. And I'm glad to see you, Pat. I did WTF today. Oh, nice! How'd I that did go? the Mark Marin podcast. It was a wonderful time. I, okay. I I only did it once before, and it was a live show with a bunch of different comics together, mm-hmm. paneling. Uh, and Mark was uh, gracious enough to uh, have me on to help promote my upcoming special, February third. Yeah. Uh, you let me down on Comedy Central midnight, February third. February seventh is the street date, where you can download it. February fifth is the replay uh, uh, at one a.m. Uh, but anyway, he had me on. It was wonderful. I think uh, I, I think he we we were meant for each other in many ways. Did you go wow. childhood up? Talk about the childhood abandonment, sure. intimacy issues, sure. rage, the whole thing. I mean, and we were. We're pretty much on the same page throughout it, which I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. <laughs> um, I mean, it's good that you found a friend. Uh, did the podcast get a mention? Uh, no, no. Wow. No, 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 wait. No, it did get a mention. It did. We'll see you in hell? Yeah, we talked about it. 
because I mentioned both podcasts, but the, the main focus... Both? Well, I have another podcast now that's coming out on, on Feral very soon. It hasn't even started. That's getting a We've mention? We've recorded several episodes. It's about to launch. Who was it with? Emotional Hangs with Kurt Braunholer and myself. You already did this. We're, uh, well, it's officially launching on Feral now. It hasn't launched this yet, a, but it's about this to... This is a fine Listen. how do you do. Well, uh, fine, how do you do? Sorry that my hour special th- that I've worked my whole career for took precedence over our the podcast plug one time. And uh, Kurt Bronner's podcast. No, no, no. I now. mentioned ours. Don't. You going to start now? I let you into Just my home. Saying, we're, we're a year in, and, and, and that's getting an equal footing on one of the biggest podcasts in America. I let you into my home. I give you my booze. I break bread with you. Mm-hmm. And you spit in my face. You come in, you take your dick out, you stand up on my dining room table, and you piss on me. You don't have a dining room table. Yeah, I'm speaking figuratively, Pat. Maybe this is the problem with your script. I don't have a dick. This is the problem with your script. You don't understand figuratively versus literally. Now, see, I did a... That's definitely the problem with my script. (laughs) I did a uh, podcast tonight, and... uh, you you got we this podcast got a mention and in the process I promoted your special which I have no part of or ties to at all. Well, thank you for doing Just that. Just so you know what what I do for you, and then uh, you know you, you all hear how that gets repaid. Well, you think you'd want to promote this podcast? It's 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 a big thing you got going. Here. I mean, you want to talk? You want to talk? Feeling like seconds? I sat here all night tonight. Didn't do a damn thing. Waiting for Pat to come in to record. Well, I did not. Shows so. up at 1145. Now, look, I'm as mad as you are about this, and I did I'm not mad. You. I'm just saying let's not talk second. I'm not your consolation prize, Pat. Now, we were supposed to do this podcast on Monday when I had no plans. That, this always gets left out, That what brings us to these points. He said, how's Wednesday? I said, great, but I am doing another podcast after work. I can come over after that. Joe said, fine. I did warn him the podcast can sometimes go long. I had no idea how long. Now, this is a huge podcast as well. It's not it's not WTF, but it's a massive podcast called The Gilmore Guys. It's my buddies Demi, Kevin Porter. Uh, they're funny dudes. I love them. I've known them forever. I used to do The Gilmore Guys podcast all the time, and it was an hour. And I hate The Gilmore Girls, but I would watch the episode. We'd go in, talk shit about The Gilmore Girls, riff. Tell jokes and go. Four hours. I go over there tonight at 7 o'clock for this podcast. And as I'm pulling in, I notice that they've switched the format. It's now on to bunheads. I knew that going in. So it's almost like kind of a joke. Now that they they made a joke during the Gilmore guys. What are you going to do when, the, when this is over? Because they make a lot of money off it. And they're like, I guess we'll go into the lady who created its next show, Bunheads. We'll do Bunhead Bros as a joke. Nobody remembers Bunheads. It's 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 a never even heard of the damn a bad thing. show that was on ABC Family. So they go, we'll do the Bunhead Bros podcast as a joke. So they go, do you want to come in and do the second episode of Bunhead Bros? I was like, all right, where do I watch Bunheads? I watch it on the ABC Family. It's a bad show, and I'm driving in and I see that Ben Schwartz uh, did the the first episode of Bunhead Bros, and it lasted three and a half hours. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So I walked in and I'm like, guys, this doesn't go three and a half hours. I mean, you, don't, you don't talk about bunheads for three and a half hours. They were like, I mean, they've started to get longer recently. It doesn't have to go that long, whatever. I would have I, I canceled. This thing was a, a firm four hours. And the podcast will be up. And we talked about this episode of Bunheads. And finally I blew up. I was like, guys, there's no urgency there's no, the, like, we need to end this. There's no, we should wrap this up. Who's running the show here? What's going on? Pat, all, it sounds to me like the inmates are running the <laughs> asylum. You're not wrong. And I'm not criticizing these guys because I love them and I think they're funny, but I started to feel like a goddamn prisoner. And I uh, I left, and they don't edit it. They put up these raw four-hour podcasts, and people listen to the whole fucking thing. Some of these podcast fans are sick. They're sick in their damn heads. What, I don't, who wants to listen to this for four hours? I told, I said, I said, this is a family guy cutaway where Peter would be like, oh, I got to go do my buddy's four hour uh, Bunheads podcast. And you cut to it and then he tries to get up and the doors are locked. And they yeah. kind of laugh, but I'm like, I'm not kidding. Yeah. I'm trapped here. 
Uh, you're real wound up tonight. I'm just looking at our waveforms up on the computer screen there. And oh I my! Mean, look at look at that. Look at yours versus mine. Well, I I, I got a lot going on. Joe. You're a, you're a chatty patty tonight. <laughs> uh, look, I'm just upset that you let them keep you there and you didn't you didn't stand up for me. You, you didn't I, get up from that. I try. You'll hear me on air. Try to leave. <laughs> like they don't let you leave. Well, thank you for plugging the special. I appreciate that. I do appreciate that. And I did mention our podcast today. And Kurtz. Well, I have things happening in my life. Have you told the people you're writing this fancy script for about your podcast? No. I think they all know about it. I wish I hadn't now that I've just revealed this note that they gave me. But Oh, boy. Boy, would I love that. Boy, would that make me happy. Well, the, the, the pilot doesn't go because of this podcast. <laughs> if, if, that, if it all hinged on that after all this work. I doubt they listen to it, which is fine. I doubt it, too. Uh, let's, let's look. Let's get into the meat of this thing, all right? Please. I mean, to me, Joe, it's always the meat. I don't think pe- when The few podcasts I do listen to and I check in and out of, I always prefer the downtime to the meat, if I'm being honest. Well, the, the, uh, the, the shitting around, you know, look, we shit around the whole time. I mean, we, we you know, it's, it's like this, this this whole podcast is ADD infused. We can't it's stay true. on anything for more than it's true. And I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with us uh, moving the thing along, because otherwise you wind up talking about bunheads for four hours. Well, that's what I'm saying. You're complaining about nobody steering the ship over at this other fucking thing. And now I'm here trying to steer the fucking ship and you're giving me a fucking mouth about well, it. I'm not giving a fucking mouth. I was trying to say I enjoy talking to you. I like talking to you, you, too. Take everything just, as an attack. I just wish it didn't always have to be during work times. I, I miss quality time with you. That's all. I, I'm mad I because I. Look, we can go out at one in the morning if you want after this is over. Are you teasing me right now? I'll have a nightcap with you. Baby, I'm in. All right, great. Oh, shit. All right. Well, look at this. If you want to. The two boys are back at it again. <laughs> the <laughs> boys are back in town. I saw a great tweet the other day, and I wish I could give credit to the person. It said, don't assume my gender just because I'm back in town. <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> I loved it. I th- you know who it was? It was my friend Everett Byram who goes by Rad Milk on Twitter. I'm going to promote him for some reason. I'm feeling generous, y'all. Uh, our dear friend Karen Kilgariff uh, from the My Favorite Murder podcast and many other things. She's a doll. A uh, co-worker. We have been uh, occasionally texting back and forth our favorite George Wallace tweets. Mm. Uh, my favorite tweeter. Yeah, he's amazing. So the one... I sent her the other day was uh, when I'm not when I'm not busy backstroking through the damn Everglades. I'm performing <laughs> at this venue in Florida, which yeah. was an amazing, amazing tweet. Yeah, may, maybe better than uh, even the the edgiest alt comedians who still every time tweet Philadelphia. I'll be in you on Friday. Yeah, yeah, I know. Guys, j- just don't make the joke. I just know. just say you're you're doing a show. I know. Or else you you go big and you go I'm I'm going through the damn Everglades like George Wallace. The reason I bring it up is because my favorite Wallace tweet of all time is I was there. I was there and everybody didn't wang chung that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's a masterpiece. Wallace has retweeted me a couple times, not to brag. Once recently, once years ago, and the time he did it years ago was the only time in my life where I've ever, like, DM'd somebody. And I was like, you're the funniest man on earth. I love your your Twitter. I'm going to be in Vegas, and I'm seeing your show at the uh, Mirage or whatever he's got. Yes, I believe you've told this tale on the podcast. I don't say that so you don't tell I it again. I believe oh. you have. I'm not saying it so you don't, don't tell it again. I think I did. I I'm mean, saying we, tell it you again. You and I have spent a lot of time together. It might have just been off air. But if I, I'm going to tell it quickly if not. I'm saying tell it again. I'm not saying don't tell it again. I, I tell him I, I, I'm going to be there. I can't wait to see you. And I, I, my intent wasn't even to ask for something. He goes, let me get you in a booth up front. He goes, you want to bring some ladies or what are you going to do? I'm like, well, no, I, I'm not going to bring the ladies. But I had a whole booth right in front of the stage to myself. Afterwards, he kind of put he does his autographs. And then he's like, let's talk talk about comedy. He's like, y- you know, he's, he, I'll sign something if you want or we can just talk. I'm like, let's talk. The most delightful man I've ever met. Did you make love to him that night? I didn't make love to him, um, and I didn't get anything signed because it felt cheap to me because he was just a great, great man. That sounds great. 
That's a nice story. Yeah, I love him. George, I, Wall- he, he's a. Uh, I'm gonna. P- we are promoting him. Follow him on Twitter. He's follow him on Twitter, Mr. George Wallace. That's like the time D- uh, Moon Unit Zappa said hello to me on Twitter. Okay, and you know what a Zappa fan I am. I've got the tattoo on my arm. I do. Never met the lady in my life. Says hello to me out of the blue one day. Made my year. Couldn't be less of a fan of Zappa. See, now I didn't. I didn't shit on your story. Why do you get to shit on my story? <laughs> just, just, just say that's good for you, Joe. It you, doesn't matter look, if you're a fan. You know, I, I think it's great for you. I, I, I just don't like Zappa. Oh my God! All right, let's let's do the movie. Yeah, well, you know what? Hold on. Even though I'm trying to steer this ship, yeah, I'm trying to move us along here, we have to mention that uh, Pat and I and our dear friends uh, Ian and Jesse. Oh Christ! How do we miss <laughs> this? Uh, one night. Uh, our friend Jesse Pop, who's a very funny comic, uh, every Monday night he has a th- an event at his apartment aptly titled Monday Night Beers. You go over, you watch a lot of Shark Tank, and you drink. Bar rescue. A lot of bar rescue, too. And you drink. So uh, one Monday, uh, I don't know, roughly two months ago, we were all over there, and uh, we, were, we were pretty knee-deep in it. And I said, guys, Burt Young, who played Paulie and Rocky... Uh, is performing in a play uh, in two months here in uh, in in L. A. He's eighty seven years old or something. Uh, does anybody want to go? Because I want to go. Yeah. Four people, hands just shot up. We're all in. Let's do it. I need to say, in my anti defense, I had not had a sip of alcohol. Don't I, I, that's that's the crazy part to me. And that's what keeps me up at night. I didn't have <laughs> beer one, and I was like, sure. Now I was I was good in the bag. I I drank about a bottle of Merlot at this point uh, <laughs> when I suggested it. And then just to put things in perspective, the next day when I sobered up, I did nothing from that point on except try to get out of going to see this play. Yeah, Pat would would almost shame me that I was that I would suggest why are we going to this? Let's not go to this. So we went. We went. We went to a uh, Mexican restaurant to get dinner before the play because it was right next to the theater. We walk into the, to the Mexican restaurant. Burt Young is sitting in the restaurant eating like chimichangas before he's got to go on stage <laughs> in 30 minutes. 30 minutes before <laughs> a huge Mexican meal, which should have been a tip-off. <laughs> so uh, the play is we, called The Last Vig. And again, Bur- Burt Young, because the joke kind of rushed through it, he played Pauly, the fat alcoholic in Rocky, and he played the uh, the old timer with the inhaler who does one last hit on The Sopranos. You'd know him if you saw him. Carry on, John. Who the hell doesn't know who Pauly and Rocky is? I feel like you might confuse him with Mickey. People don't know Rocky. Oh, Pauly, Pauly, everybody's favorite young, character. We have a very young hip crowd. The uh, so so we're sitting there. We're in a booth. It's Jesse, Pat, me, and uh, Ian. We're in a booth. We, we, we've had quite a few margaritas at this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we did a shot of, I said, let's get a shot of tequila for the road. And some guy next to us, we ordered oh, yeah. Don Julio or some shit. And the guy next to us goes, you're not going to get the house tequila. <laughs> yeah, you got to get Antonioni's tequila. <laughs> so we get get it. It, 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 it was like. It was like a prairie fire going down your throat. It was just paint thinner. It was not even a color that tequila has ever been. It was sort of a maroon. Yes. <laughs> so we're like, all right, let's do this thing. I'm still thinking of how do we get out of this up until the last minute. We go in. I tell you, I've never sobered up so fast as 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 five minutes into this fucking play when I realized that I was trapped. We grab. Uh, we were on the way in. We say, "Is there a bar?" To the person who sells the tickets. Yeah. Because it was will call. We had. To, we go. Is there a bar? He goes. Well, I can sell you beer. Yeah. That's never a good sign <laughs> when the will call booth is yeah. what's where they you buy the alcohol. So we buy. We had to walk across the stage to get to our seats, which means that if you want to leave, you have to walk across the stage. You have to walk in front of the actors as they're performing with about six inches between you. In other words, you can't leave unless you're just a complete animal. Now here's the thing. Yeah. In a situ, as you may suspect, uh, listener, dear listener, the play's not going to be good. Uh, but, but, but I'll tell you what, you don't suspect how not good. Yeah, but but you, you, as nor did any of you, us. You, here's the thing: were this to have been a good play, 
That would have been magical. Yeah. We would have been like, you had to walk across the stage. It was so intimate. There, yeah. there could have been more than 50 seats in this thing. So we're sitting there. There's a little anticipation. Is this going to be good? This is pretty cool. I'll tell you the minute I knew we were in trouble. Lights go down. Lights come up. First character comes on stage. He's out there for about two minutes before Burt Young's entrance. Burt Young walks in. Zero applause. Nothing. <laughs> I couldn't believe that. Nothing. And we didn't discuss it after the show. Nothing. I couldn't believe that. Yeah. A 50-person theater. Burt Young, who, the only reason anybody's there, comes out and nobody clapped. And nobody he kind of waited for it. Yeah. Nobody claps. Nobody does anything. The first character that comes out, by the way, is like a Malibu's most wanted style Jamie Kennedy <laughs> white rapper in like kind of a big costume. Yes. And it's like, uh oh, I believe it was the Malibu's most wanted costume. <laughs> it was some yeah. sort of a do rag and like, yeah, like, which at one point, one of the it's a play about old Italian mobsters. And at one point, one of the 70 year old mobsters goes to about this kid. He goes, the kid in the do rag. Yeah, it's like. That guy wouldn't know what a do-rag is. Well, I made a bet with Joe when I read the synopsis, and it said, uh, Paul, uh, you know, Burt Young plays this old mobster, and uh, his sidekick is a hip-hop-loving what, whatever the hell. And I'm saying, guys, what do we think the odds are that Burt Young calls this guy the N-word? And it but didn't then happen. he came out and it was a white man, so it, it didn't matter. It didn't happen. He yeah. didn't even. And I, my bet was he wouldn't say it to the kid. He'd refer to the music in some derogatory or racist yeah. way. And that never happened either. No. Um, they, there was no music. I don't mean to say it like I'm disappointed. I was just surprised. No, believe us, we, we, we weren't angling for the N-word. I just <laughs> was like, something about this feels like it's going to get weird. So, uh, so Burt Young comes out to zero pause applause uh sits down uh, at a desk uh you know where his character conducts his daily business yeah and proceeds to not just read every line that he has to deliver in the play from various pieces of hidden paper on the desk hidden uh because on several occasions he lifted the paper up to his eyes to see it and then, you could he you, that, you did see the paper that, 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 he never he he did never he he, he would Let's, bend up half the paper, and you saw him reading off the paper. Okay, but he, he wasn't holding it into the air. He wasn't holding it up to yeah. the light, no. Uh, and not only is he reading the lines, literally reading them, because he doesn't know them. Now, granted, look, there's a preview. Maybe it was whatever. He's, he's mumbling it and whispering. You couldn't hear what he was saying. You couldn't the hear. other actors couldn't hear what he was saying. Uh, and then uh, the highlight for me was uh, at one point, Burt Young goes, Ah, fungool. Which, for those of you that don't know, that means fuck in Italian. And why does he say this? Well, it's an ad lib because the earpiece that they're clearly feeding him his dialogue through has fallen out of his ear. And he has to pick it up, put it back into his ear. A bright orange earpiece falls out of his ear to the ground. <laughs> he picks it up, places it back in. So you know that it's not set right. And you know he's not <laughs> hearing things anymore. And then the paper really starts taking center stage. <laughs> And I sent Joe today a review of the play, and they pointed out something that I kind of suspected but didn't know well enough, is that the other actors are referring to lines that Burt Young did not say. Yeah. D wait. wait there were, you, Jesse sent us the review. You're, I sent the review. Jesse. I thought you Jesse sent it. I sent it oh, to you, you and Jesse. Sent it. Yeah, it, 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 it doesn't matter. But I, oh, I, I, thought, I thought Jesse sent it. I sent it. All right. Okay. Listen, I'm not. Nobody's trying it. to take your credit away from That's you. All right. It felt that way. But. I felt a little bit like you were stealing it from Jesse. I got to be honest, <laughs> and I felt like I had to say something. No, I, I looked up reviews. There was one review, and they were like, "And it was a wow, rough this one. Is bad. It was a rough review, and honestly, not rough enough." And I'll tell you when I tapped out of the play, and that, and this is nobody could, uh, nobody uh, in the our group that we went with could understand why. If you're Italian or if you're raised Italian like I was, you know that it's not spaghetti sauce. It's called gravy. It's Sunday gravy. It is a tradition. It is an, ev an event. There, it, it is such a thing. It is such a staple thing. It's, it, there's a line in this play where you this mobster. You know it mobster, if you watched a mob movie ever. If you watched right. the Sopranos ever. This mobster comes in and he goes, I'd stop by because I was at home making my sauce. And... <laughs> I was furious. You would never call it sauce. In fact, not only would you not call it sauce, you'd be offended if somebody called it sauce. Then he goes. Should we also say he was in a Target tracksuit? Yeah, he was in a Target tracksuit. <laughs> then he goes, 
Uh, he goes, but I <laughs> and it's noon, and he pours himself like a tall scotch. Every character, because there's only a bar and a and a desk on oh, the entire stage. Yeah. Every character, even though it's established that it's midday, pours themselves a tall drink while they're doing their lines because it's the only thing they have to do. Yeah, because they're waiting for Burt Young to be fed <laughs> dialogue from yeah, various yeah, yeah. sources. By the way, a lot but, of his dialogue is asking if he can get a lot of soup to bring home to his wife because she has the gout in her leg. Yeah. So he, he's in the back of a Chinese restaurant. He keeps asking this Chinese guy, no, but I, I really want a lot of soup, a lot of soup to bring home to my wife. And he's like, I'll get you some soup. No, but I By want... the way, the, the, the Chinese guy who owns the restaurant, yeah. who comes in and does, in a row, several shots of tequila. <laughs> yeah, and then sh- <laughs> it doesn't register on him at all that he's done all this tequila. He's doing shot after shot of tequila, and then going back out and running his restaurant. <laughs> yeah, and Bert, Bert Young's like, I need this soup for my wife. Then the wife calls in, and they got this recording of a woman being like, baby... My leg hurts. Can you bring me home some of that soup from the Chinese restaurant? And then Burt Young's like, yeah, baby, I'll bring you home the soup. She's like, I know, but I want a lot of soup. Baby, I promise you I'll bring you home the soup. Don't you know I love you? This goes on for 10 minutes. Yeah, the gout. Then he hangs up on her, and then he tells the Chinese man, hey, uh, I want a lot of soup for my wife's leg. She's got yeah. the gout. We hear it all again. Yeah, yeah. Something's telling me it wasn't supposed to be like that. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you're right. Uh, and then my favorite line in the whole thing was when the guy that said he has, was making the sauce, uh, the reason he was out of the house when he was making his sauce, which he gets in the zone when he makes, he says, I always I get, get in the zone when I make my sauce is because he said, uh, he didn't have any garlic and he goes, you know me, I could have skipped that step, but I just can't skip a step. The first step mm-hmm. in making the gravy. This wasn't, I didn't have any basil. Right. Garlic. Yeah. Garlic, <laughs> which you need to put into the meatballs and, and it, you need to saute for the now sauce. Now, he was basically also indicating that garlic is his special ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That like his kind of secret recipe that nobody <laughs> knows about in Italian cooking was garlic. <laughs> it was written by an Italian man. It's Yeah, it would literally been like a Mexican person being like, yeah. you know how I, I like to put in a little cumin right <laughs> yeah uh so we are sitting there and the play is supposed to be 90 minutes so i'm like well we can make 45 but as the reviewer of this play pointed out it's billed as a 90 minute play and it lasts a very long feeling two hours because burt young is just kind of winging it and the other actors are like um okay by the way the guy who played the white rapper was kind of good I thought he was good. I thought the the guy that played the 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 Chinese guy was good. Ch- Chinese restaurant owner was good. Uh, I thought the lady on the phone was good. Yeah, uh, the I problem everybody... was really Burt Young, and he he also showed no- nothing on his face that indicated I'm in over my head here. I don't think he knew. I think he's old. Might be a little senile. And I think they hired. I God, forgive me for saying this. No. Yeah, I think they I think they hired him, and the, he showed up, and they were like, uh oh. But what's He's infuriating, and this is what this is what happens in Hollywood, and to bring it full circle, this is why this is the the shittiest fucking town in the world, is that I guarantee that this playwright is telling everyone after the show, well, I wrote this brilliant script and Burt Young ruined it. That's what's happening. And the script was not the good The fact either. of the matter is, this is one of the worst scripts that's ever been written. Like I, when I would take screenwriting in college or even high school, nobody had anything this bad. And the plot, as it were, is that $100,000 of casino chips were lost by a bookie out on the town, and they're trying to get them back. So we left at, at uh, intermission and just well, we were... leave it at, I t- I t- right towards the end of Act 1, which I didn't know was towards the end. Yeah. I mean, the thing is falling apart at the seams. I text Pat. He's three seats over from me. I just write, this is a real scene, man. Yeah. He writes back, we are gone at intermission. Yeah. The lights go up go down and back up again at intermission we're we are darting across the stage we get to the door we can't leave because the cast has to go out through the main yeah. entrance a woman was guiding Bert young back to the mexican <laughs> restaurant presumably to have another meal but so the lights dimmed and then came back up and 
in between that time where the lights dimmed and came up, I was out the door. So scared was I that I would be trapped for another hour of this. And then in the review, apparently, the the key dilemma of the casino chips is never resolved. No. So either the play didn't resolve it or more likely Burt Young was kind of like, I guess we're done here and just ended the play. Now, we made a pact. We made a pact that night that we would go back on closing night to see if there was any improvement. I'm not doing that. Uh, I don't want to do do it, it, but I think we need to do it. I'd have to be a lot more drunk than I was or high or something. Well, let's get fucking wasted and go. If we can maybe do like an edible and take an Uber over there, but then we're going to be cackling at this shit. We eat the fish. We, you can smoke weed in public now in Los Angeles. It's officially illegal. You, in public? Legal. I heard you can smoke it outside now. Well, I tell you, the people outside your apartment sure were. Hey, folks. They we were. eat some edibles. We go over there. We get drunk at that Mexican joint. We have those delicious Mexican ribs again. Those I love were that wonderful. place. Uh, but, but, Joe, we spent $20 because this was a preview night. If we go back, the tickets are $40. Pat, that's a risk I'm willing to take. It's not a risk. Like, what is the risk? That maybe it'll be a great play? Yeah. And well, then maybe folks, it'll be worth the extra 20 bucks. These people had booked this venue for a month. This thing goes till like, February 12th. It's a real bummer, man, because I'm a big Burt Young fan, not just from Rocky. I like I like Amityville Part 2 quite a bit, and uh, I enjoy him in that film. And He's in an episode of The Sopranos that is one of the best standalone episodes of a show I've ever seen in my life. You know, it's an amazing episode. Pope of Greenwich Village. Yeah, he's a great actor. Um, he's not anymore, folks. Listen, speaking of, uh, well, not even, what a shitty transition, sorry. Uh, we we have to get to the movie. I feel like we this ti- this episode needs to be titled "The Last Vig" and <laughs> you Blair might Witch. Right. And uh, people will figure out why it's titled that after yeah. they've heard this. Uh, but we're almost forty minutes in, and we have not gotten to the movie at hand. Uh, That's true for our horror movie centric podcast. That's true. Uh, I I think we can go ahead and skip the 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 movie corner recap that's fine i I'll feel do, like that be, kind of was that for this the, the last vig was that for this episode. it is but real quick because i saw one brand new movie and I, and we like this podcast to be fairly current i saw our, uh patriots day uh-huh. the new peter berg movie about the boston marathon bombing starring marky mark and uh i gotta tell you it's really a, a solid and pretty exciting movie and it felt almost 80s style in that the portrayal of the villains was, you know, bordered on a little bit racist and weird. Right. Um, you know, it, it bordered on like, uh, you know, I hate Muslims kind of a kind of a vibe. But, you know, they did blow up a fucking marathon. So, yeah, I got you. Um, it, it was solid. Marky Mark was pretty good. There were some really tense, really well done action sequences. And I'm starting to really like Peter Berg as a director of. Very effective, true stories told in like a you are there kind of feeling. Going back to Friday Night Lights, yeah. Deepwater Horizon, etc. And Patriot's Day was even better than Deepwater Horizon. Uh, Deepwater Horizon? That came out, yeah. That's not a movie. That was with Marky Mark, yeah. You're thinking of Deep Horizon, which is a horror movie. I remember Deep Horizon, but I'm talking about Deepwater Horizon. I don't think it's called Deepwater Horizon. Now, you've fucked up so many titles of so many things <laughs> i don't fuck up titles. the latest of which was when you called the sh- the, sh- the show house dr house dr MD. house md uh, <laughs> look i'm looking I, i'm pretty sure it's called deep water horizon and i'll prove that in one second but folks here's why wa- here's where this movie lives is jk simmons is fucking awesome in it i love this actor i always have you love him too i love him he's got a scene where he's like walking into a firefight like a big like shootout and when I looked this up, I couldn't believe this this was a true thing. All these cops are trying to catch this one college-age terrorist on a, on a residential street. And it goes completely awry. It's the best scene in the movie. J.K. Simmons is so fucking good in this. And uh, John Goodman's in there. Kevin Bacon's in there. It's a great cast. The Bake. I haven't seen The Bake in a minute. Yeah, he's great. He plays the FBI guy who comes good. in. He's always good in a role like that. Uh, it, look, it, it's a B 
But, you know, for an HBO On Demand, like, you'd have a great day watching that movie. Uh, and by the way, I was right. Deepwater Horizon. Deepwater Horizon. It's about the uh, the offshore drilling rig that exploded and created the worst oil spill in U.S. Makes history. me think of Come On Up for the Horizon. Come on up. Uh, I saw The Bye Bye Man. Joe, why didn't we go see The Bye Bye Man for the podcast? I saw it with a friend of mine. Kurt Bronner? No, I saw it with a lady friend of mine. Oh. Yeah. Romantic? Look. That's none of your business. Should I go see it and we do it for the podcast? Uh, I hear I, it's one of the worst movies ever made. I would love you to see it. It is a pile of stinking dog shit. <laughs> I am furious at it. Uh, you know what? I actually and thought... I don't want to blow it by shitting on it right now. I want you to see it, and I want to do an episode about it. All right, we'll do it. Because it is a disgrace to filmmaking. That's all I've ever heard. And I thought to myself, if they are ballsy enough in this Twitter age... To call this movie the Bye Bye Man, I bet it's going to be great because they have the conviction to call it this terrible, lame, cheesy title, and apparently it's not. Uh, it is it is a fucking pile of shit. That's what and I've it, heard. it starts like, okay, I'm not going to get into it. I want you to see it. And I want to. I really, really, really want to trash it. I mean, it's I'll it's uh, it is a it is a fucking disaster. I'm in. Um, all right. All right. Well, folks, look, finally we get to it. We're here to talk about Blair Witch. Now, Pat, if you take the helm, I'm going to grab us two brewskis. I'll do it. I'm going to take the helm. We're going to talk about the new Blair Witch. And I told Joe I want to be a little cautious here because uh, the writer of Blair Witch, Simon Barrett, follows me on Twitter. I think he's incredibly funny. And a very gifted screenwriter who did The Guest and, and You're Next, both of which were directed by Adam Wingard, who also directed Blair Witch. And I think that Blair Witch is not a particularly good movie. So I told Joe, I felt a little weird about it. Not that we're friends, but you know, when you're Twitter pals with somebody, you feel a little conflicted. I don't think he's going to listen to this, but I'm just saying. I think that the guest is fucking fantastic. I think Adam Wingard is a very great, exciting new horror director who's clearly modeling himself after like a John Carpenter. And I love what they do. This Blair Witch just kind of wasn't for me. It was very loud, and uh, I felt exhausted by it. Well, I, I, um, I'll shoot you straight, folks, because I'm not like Mr. Hollywood over here. Look. Keeping well, tabs on who's following me on Twitter can say this, can not say that. I'm not one of these guys. Look, I'm just trying to keep my uh, my Audi in the shop. You know I, what I'm saying? <laughs> I loved Blair Witch, hated your next. I, I, I Did was you? Almost offended by it, hated it. Did you like the guest? Never saw the guest. The guest is great. We could do the guest on here. Uh, I'm not against it. The guest to me looked like it's the not horror, looked like another like Pacific Heights kind of thing. Uh, or what's the one with Leota and Madeline Stowe? Unlawful Entry. I love both of those movies. I, I don't dislike them. It just it just seemed like another one of those kinds of movies. What's the one with Sam Jackson and Patrick Wilson? Uh, Lakeview Terrace. Yeah, those it, are some. That's one of my favorite genres, and they don't really make them anymore. They're 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 good movies. Yeah. I just they're I've been just not one for they're quite not some a, time. a type of uh, film that I'm anxious to see. All right. So um, I didn't see the guest, but I did see You're Next in the theater. I thought it was. Uh, terrible. Okay. Uh, I thought there were so many logic holes in the film. Uh, th just things where you're. I, I I get very angry when I'm watching a movie and I'm and I'm watching people make decisions where I'm going, God damn it! Just if why is nobody saying to just do this? Yeah. And I felt like there was a lot of that in your next. Yeah. Uh, and and I wasn't buying the plot twists either. The plot twists were a little too crazy and, and felt a little too contrived for me where it was like, look what we just did. You didn't see that coming, did you? And it's like, well, no, I didn't because it doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, that for, being me, for me, just because that movie introduced me to the song Looking for the Magic by the Dwight Twilley Band. It's a 70s song. They're kind of a Tom Petty-ish outfit. Uh, it was my most played song of last year. It came out like 1976. Uh, 
that to me was enough to sell me on the movie, honestly. Well, the one thing I did like about Your Next is it had the guy from Kingpin in it. It's the only other movie I've ever seen him in. <laughs> the guy with the wear eyeliner throughout Kingpin? Yes, yeah. 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 The guy, the guy yeah, from the, like Entertainment Tonight. The guy that for some reason is a bowling alley in his yeah. uh, basement. I just read yeah. a, like an oral history of Kingpin that I, I should have sent to you and I will send to you where they talked about all the casting and everything that went into it. And they were like, uh, because of Ray Liotta and Something Wild, wore, they were like, the whole time they watched Something Wild, they were like, is he wearing eyeliner? <laughs> and they were, that's how little, that's how, why I love those early Fairly Bros movies is because they were so dense with jokes, but they would also do stuff that it's like almost dangerous. It's so stupid. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, our villain's going to wear very obvious eyeliner. <laughs> In every scene, oh, that's and he great. does. They were like, "Yeah, that's we great. just said you do it too." Yeah, it's 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 an odd it's an odd character. Uh, it's great though. Yeah. Um. Uh. So so Blair Witch. Now I, I I really liked Blair Witch quite a bit. Uh. And I hate the original Blair Witch. Okay. So let's let's go starting with the original and walk our way up. So, the original Blair Witch Project. I saw it the same year as The Sixth Sense, and. The Sixth Sense I saw with a 105 degree fever and I almost bl- had a heart attack <laughs> when uh, Misha Barton comes out and pukes, it was, as we've discussed. I've leapt up into my seat when I saw that in the theater. I mean, I, that, I, I knew that I was sick and that was the scene that made me realize that I, I honestly was close to death. I really was. Um, and that same, it almost seems like the same Well, that would have been weird if you died during that movie. Then Haley Joel Osment would have to help you, <laughs> help you out yeah, somehow. and he would have been able to see me. <clears throat> uh, that's it. Feels like that same summer. Maybe I'm remembering it wrong, but I think they were both '99. I saw the Blair Witch Project. Yeah, it's around there. And I got to tell you, hey, there are moments I haven't seen it in, honestly, almost 20 years. But there are moments where you're kind of bored, moments where you're kind of frustrated. But it was I saw it early enough where I thought it could be real, even though I knew it wasn't. I was in high school. But at the end, that that final 15 minutes where they go in there and like are standing in that barn, I remember my heart going so fast, and it was very similar to the Sixth Sense experience, where I've never had anything like it since, except when you and I saw It Follows. Yeah, I um, loved It Follows. Which uh, there were a couple moments in that that really, really got to me. But just where you feel your heart going a mile a minute, that never happens for me anymore because my heart is so dead. <laughs> But that original Blair Witch did it for me, and to that I tip my hat. I don't think it's a it's a classic, but it was really effective in its day. Why didn't you like it, Joe? Um, I thought it started great. Uh, I was very and because I knew it was fake going into right. I was very impressed at knowing it was a contrived film, uh, um, seeing how well or how convincingly they made it seem like an actual documentary yeah an actual found footage uh because at that point found footage hadn't been done to death and and it, so so i, I appreciate well, like you got to give it some props i appreciate it in the way uh that i you know that i appreciate uh the beatles I don't like the Beatles. I don't okay. enjoy their music. I've tried and tried and tried. I don't like it. I don't care for the music. I get annoyed that everybody tells me it's so brilliant all the time. I want to go on record as loving the Beatles. If That's I may. fine. But I appreciate them yeah. for what they did. So right. I appreciate the Blair Witch film that it broke some new ground. And, uh, and, it, and, it, and it, it pulled off an amazing feat of shooting a movie for five grand or whatever it was and making a gazillion dollars yeah that being said at the end of the day i was like i'm watching people find piles of rocks like i'm not scared i'm not freaked out yeah and there to me there was no real payoff other than i mean the 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 kid the guy in the corner at the end that was kind of cool um i don't even remember specifics i just remember being so fucking freaked out by the last 10 or so minutes i i need a little more i need to see something I don't have to see a lot. I need to see something, which is why I like this new one. Now, wait. Let's let's go to skip over Book of Shadows, as tempting as it is to do so. Now, Book of Shadows, I mean, if it were, if if I I have a copy of it right here, if I had a copy, I'd spit on it right now. (laughs) I I I saw Book of Shadows opening night with some friends of mine, and I don't remember anything about it except 
I, I'm going to be real honest with you folks. In early high school, I was very into the bare naked ladies. Oh, Jesus fucking This Christ. was before one week hit. And they, oh, so you were, you were into the good stuff. The good stuff. Yeah, the early. Okay. I'm not proud of this, but I do, I do think they have some great songs. I haven't listened to them in 20 years. God damn it, Pat. Look, I'm not proud of this. You sound like a goddamn C person. I'm not proud of this, but then you I... You sound like a man that lives in a... In a, in a I'm a, trying to open up. Like like a man that lives in on a dock. I'm trying to open up to under our a, listeners. Under a boardwalk or I'm something. I'm trying to open up to our listeners and say that I might have had a, both a t-shirt and a bumper sticker that said BNL. Oh, my... You had a bumper sticker? This was early high you're, school. You're a pig person. We're talking 14 years old. I don't give a shit. Uh, if you've heard their live... <laughs> I'm not going to stand up for the Barnacle Ladies. But their live <laughs> album, you're like, okay, these guys are pretty good. No. Now, and I'm a guy who, even in high school, when all my friends were obsessed with it, I didn't like Dave Matthews or any of this shit. I like the Barenaked Ladies. Doesn't just, make up for it. I'm just telling you. Doesn't make up for it. I know it doesn't. I'm not proud of it. But but at some point, I like a lot of people around that age, I started turning more to your Nirvana. And, and honestly, for me, it was bands like the Toadies and things that might not be Super cool the nowadays. Toadies are great. Yeah, I great fucking pair. love the Toadies and yeah. getting into cooler and cooler shit. And I saw at Mississippi Nights, which is a tiny, tiny venue where I saw many, many great bands of the day. I went and saw, and you will know us by the Trail of Our Dead, who was a, at least yeah. their first album. It's fucking amazing. Yeah. And the openers were Queens of the Stone Age in a tiny theater. And to this day, they're one of my favorite bands, Queens of the Stone Age. And they played, and it was so loud that people were throwing glasses of beer at the stage. Rock, hardcore rock dudes, like, turn this down. You're right. damaging our ears. Right. We don't like this. Were well, you sure they just weren't saying, we don't like what you're doing? We hate you? No, it was it was a loudness thing. Okay. And a right. couple years later, I saw them open for the Foo Fighters, and they were so loud that I wanted to kill myself. Okay. They've stopped doing that. I'm a huge fan of that band. But they come out, and it was like... They do nicotine Valium, yeah, yeah, Vicodin, marijuana, yeah. ecstasy, and alcohol, all of which are drugs that I had not done at that time, and many of them I still have not done. But I was like, whatever this is, and I didn't drink till I was twenty three, and I was probably seventeen. I was like, I love this shit. Yeah, they're, I'm into they're this. Great. I love this guy. And Book of Shadows opens with that song, and I hadn't heard it since that live show, and I was like. Okay, this is going to be like some dark fucking shit. I'm ready for this. I mean, it it's the guys that made the Paradise Lost movies, which are some of the best documentaries ever made. Those and are the guys some that kind made, of monster. Those are the guys that made they Book of were Shadows. Yes, they were going from these like amazing documentaries. This was their chance at, at doing uh, wow. a narrative film. And I don't remember a single thing about Book of Shadows. I just remember all of us being like, this is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my entire life. It's a pile of uh, dog shit, once again. Yeah. Uh, the the Every character in the movie looks like... Remember that conveyor belt scene at the in Austin Powers after they thaw him out? Yes. It looks like they took every character in the movie and did that through a hot topic. Yeah. And they just went in like like in a, like a Scooby-Doo kind of thing. They just, on a conveyor belt, went in one side naked and came out the other side of the hot topic like in, <laughs> in costume for the movie. It, it's it's but, no found footage, right? It's all no. It's it's just it's a, a standard horror. It's movie. a full scripted whatever. And do you thing. see a witch? I can't remember if you see anything. If and you are they do, going? Uh, are, is it a world like a couple years after the events of the Blair Witch Project? It's a it's a it's a scripted and a scripted film, and the narrative is that these characters saw the Blair Witch Project and now are going to see if it's real. Okay, which is basically. The plot of every Blair Witch movie. Right. We want to go see if this is real. Right. They go up to the woods. They all end up dying by the hands of the witch's magic or whatever. Uh, and then at the end of the movie, the way the witch... This is the one thing I really remember, and it is, it is my... And I've mentioned it before in this podcast. It is my cardinal, cardinal sin of a horror movie. Uh, above all other pet peeves I have about horror movie tropes. At the end of the movie, the way the Blair Witch covers her tracks so nobody believes in her or whatever is they all these files appear at the scene of the crime on like the different people. Manila envelope files? Yeah. 
Okay. That incriminate them to it looks like they all killed one another or one of them killed everybody or something like that. So so basically the Blair Witch went shopping at that went to Staples and <laughs> bought supplies and just in case I need these, yeah, yeah. I'll put these files together. That's my <laughs> biggest pet peeve ever. Were is, they labeled? Did she use the label yeah, maker? Yeah, no, there's like a, there's like their names are on them and stuff, and there's like photos and paper yeah. clips, and Last it's all name very comma first. very neatly done. The Blair Witch is very very neat. She's detail oriented, but uh, that's why I hired her to work at my temp agency. Yeah, yeah. So my friend uh, Jim Pinkstone, uh, your friend too, love Jim, who we always talk about on here. Uh, you know, he always bitched about in the in the House on Haunted Hill remake the way they get Terrible. everybody to the house is that they're they're invited by an email. So he's like. So he was always like, so so the the house, the evil house, opened a <laughs> hotmail account and started emailing yeah. people. It's why I always had a problem with the ring. It's like <laughs> evil house at MSN dot com. Yeah. So it's it's the, now the ring to me is one of the best horror movies of the last 20 years. Uh, I think it's a decent mystery movie. But uh, here's what I always say. If a horror movie is scary, it's a good horror movie, regardless of the things that might bother a uh, you, for example. The Ring is not a bad movie, but and my one problem was always that the the fact that the ghost had to be sitting there going, they seem to be into this videotape medium. Let me yeah. get into that. <laughs> Which in this new one now, it's going to clearly have to be a YouTube video. So I'm I guess sure. somebody uploaded Did it. Did you watch Unfriended like I told you to? I still haven't seen it, no. Unfriended, folks, and I'll recommend it again. If you want to talk about that Blair Witch spirit of like a five thousand dollar movie being like super effective, Unfriended is great. It's not a it's not a classic, but like it's it's it made you kick yourself because you're like I could have done this for five grand with my friends and made you know eighty million dollars. Yeah, or just had a movie that you made for, spent five grand on that nobody saw. Even that is cool. Yeah, I, I know, made it a is. movie. You know now, That's it. so Blair Witch Two, we both agreed. Dog shit. Blair Witch 1. I remember we, nothing except Feel Good Hit of the Summer by Queens of Stone Age. Blair Witch Project, the original, we agree, was groundbreaking. You know, you liked it more than I did. I, I wasn't a fan. Let's get on to the newest one, Blair Witch. Now, and the now reason, you know what cracks me up is that I had the VHS of Blair Witch Project because eventually Blockbuster ordered so many copies, and I worked at Blockbuster, that it was selling for 99 cents. Yeah. So I owned it, of course, and then... Eventually, a Target or something someday, I saw the DVD for like two ninety nine, and I bought it. But I was like, I don't know why I'm even doing this. I've never watched it. But what cracks me up a little bit is that the Blair Witch Project is available for purchase on Blu-ray. <laughs> the movie looks like security footage. Well, that's, I, I, you know, we were talking about that before. Like, I love the, I love the work that Scream Factory is doing. Mm-hmm. But I'm not that crazy that it's all on Blu-ray. I don't. I don't necessarily want. There are certain horror movies where I would like this sort of high-res, remastered, uh, 1080p, 4K, yeah, whatever, like 2K, a, like whatever the fuck you call or, it, or the thing. Yeah, but like you know, certain horror movies. I, I you know, I, I just I got Pinkstone again. Gave me Creep Show on VHS for Christmas. I want that on VHS. I already yep. had it on DVD, but I want that on VHS. I don't want that on Blu-ray. Right. You know, I got Creepshow 2, the, 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 this new uh, collector's edition on Blu-ray for Christmas, um, mostly because I wanted to see what the special features were like and everything. But, you know, I, I'm a little less inclined to watch the 2K restoration than I am to watch the sure. sort of grainy transfer on the DVD. Sure. Uh, now, now, Blair Witch is basically the same story as... The original, they're based. They were trying to find um, the Blair Witch information on, yeah, and uh, on his sister who died. Or whatever. and by the way, if you're unfamiliar with this film for for any reason, the Blair Witch is uh, it's basically the Blair from uh, Facts of Life <laughs> uh, yeah. became a witch. Yeah. Um, I by the way, now look, I already confessed to bare naked ladies. I'm really opening up tonight. I did. It was with seven other people. We we got assigned to do uh, video projects at, in uh, film school, and it was seven people. And we did a short film that I think I still own, and it was called "The Nair," meaning like the hair removal. Yeah. The Nair bitch project. Okay, and what and what happened? And I I want to be very clear that this was not my idea, and this is why I hate working in groups to this day. But uh, 
folks. I mean, it, it, I mean it, we're it, now starting to realize why you're getting all these notes, <laughs> folks. It wasn't script. funny. This wasn't my project. Anyway, uh, what was the plot of the Nair Bitch Project? I think you could figure it out. No, I can't. That's why I'm asking. I actually, I, I don't, don't even get what the joke would be. I think this was it was something a very very hot girl in my class pitched, and I was like, good idea, because I wanted to have sex with her. Spoiler alert! It's a ghost that uses didn't Nair come close or something. Yeah, I think in the in the end it was revealed that the witch had like super hairy legs. Jesus Christ! I, I know, and I didn't have I didn't even so much as <sighs> touch this girl, folks. I don't feel good about it. Um. The new Blair Witch. Here was, and I just watched it on Blu-ray. Here's my issue. For an hour, uh, I I wasn't scared, and also it was so fucking loud and just constantly loud. It's there real was, loud. <laughs> there was no quiet. There was no like. I, quiet is scary. Loud is not scary. And these, it was just hammering me over the head. And everyone who was in it was screaming the entire time so they're doing it found footage style but everyone holding the camera or having the camera pointed at them is going ah, ah, screaming and i keep turning the volume down and down and down and i'm getting annoyed now the last half hour of this thing had some great scares it was still loud but and i'm not trying to be some old man here either but there was no variance in the tone of it it was just like an endless assault to me However, when she finds the like the tapeworm thing in her leg and pulls it out, that was really, really fucking effective and scary. Particularly, although this is not, not the hardest thing to do to make people scared, when that girl is trying to crawl out of that ever yeah. tightening tunnel, yeah, that really fucking freaked me out. Probably because I'm claustrophobic, obviously. But I was like, okay, this is great. It didn't, to me, make up for the previous hour of, like, just generic, loud nothing. I thought I thought that this film was what I wanted the f- original film to be. All right. It was found footage, which I'm not a big fan of, but it was found footage done very well. It was uh, suspenseful, and then there was some payoff. I liked that there was a payoff. I thought the scariest part was... The the when the fucking tents started flying up in the air, yeah, that like really freaked me out for some reason. So I liked that it had payoff. I liked. I also liked that it had purpose, and it wasn't just, hey, we're just gonna go up into the woods to see if this witch thing is real. It was. It was, the plot. If you haven't seen it, is the brother of Heather. Is that the girl in the Heather, first one? Yeah. Uh, he think it's her brother, and he thinks that he. He sees a video online, and he thinks that he has found her, and he's going up to the woods to, to see because he thinks she's still out there somewhere. So I like that it had a little more of a personal purpose to it. It wasn't just aimless wandering. Uh, I, I, I thought I liked that they used all the major scare tactics from the first film as just sort of the the you know initial appetizers into the real scares of this film. And I also liked... Oh, no, actually, I also did, and I didn't, but I didn't like, uh, and and all found footage movies do this, and guys, stop doing this with every found footage. They're, they're just, just hear me for a second. Every shot doesn't have to start with the camera turning on. Yeah. It's, it's, this one, to its credit, tried to differentiate it by putting on, like, my glasses have a camera in them or whatever, but... It, but still, every yeah. single shot is like, it's like... There, there, it's the, it's that wild like tilt up like the camera just turned on and I'm 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 getting my perspective. Yeah. If, if if this was truly found footage, people would edit it in a way where they would cut that stuff out. Number one. Number two, they would put like title cards and things into the footage. They would build it into a documentary. No documentary that was constructed from found footage would literally just be the found footage. Yeah, which is that's my biggest gripe with the that's my only gripe with the movie. It it could have been presented in a way with interstitial interviews and things like that. Well, see, that's not going to be scary, though, to me. Like if it's some guy like talking about it who survived, that's not scary to me. I don't need a guy talking about it who survived. But you you put in it's like that. I I, I love the movie Bernie. Oh, sure. With Jack Black. Yeah, that's a sort of a mockumentary it's 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 a hybrid but like when they when it's cutting away to all the townspeople throughout the movie 
you know, Husbands and Wives by Woody Allen does it too, where it yep. keeps cutting to the to the to the interviews with the different couples and stuff. They do when it Harry Met Sally. Yeah. Does it. I think that's an effective thing, and it and it and it sells the believability. If anybody was building a document, if 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 because these the Blair Witch movies are presented as documentaries, right? You would, if you were a filmmaker, you wouldn't just splice together all the found footage. You would splice it together with some sort of narrative around it. That's true. I think there have been movies that have done that, but I, I can't think of any offhand. Very few. What is your favorite? I've heard The Bay is kind of interesting, which is like, I think it's Barry Levinson. The Bay? The Bay is a found footage horror movie that I've heard is pretty good. I've never even heard of it. But uh, do you have like a favorite found footage movie? I don't know that I do. I thought Chronicle was pretty cool when I saw it. Chronicle was cool. I, I look I, to be honest. I'm not a found footage fan. I would say that this was probably the best one I'd ever seen. Yeah, I mean that's, I, that's I'd saying be, something. I, th- I thought it had a, a very strong last half hour, but to to me, it needed some sort of tonal. I didn't give a shit about anyone in it, which is always a, a big sticking point for me. Um, I mean, if if you're strictly saying here's six people they're kind of unlikable and we're going to follow them into the woods. I got to say, I need a little more romance got, than that. I mean, I, I, I don't care about them. I was pretty invested in the brother of okay. Heather. I was interested in that. And I was pretty invested in that weird couple that like takes them in. The, they were interesting. Yeah. And I, and when I, they were like, we've been gone for five days. That was kind of cool. And it kept me guessing like, but I'm trying to think of other found footage movies. Uh, well, what other? You know, I, I, yeah, Chronicle was fine. Uh, yeah, I mean, Pro- Project X I thought really sucked, just because that guy was the uh, monkey movie with Matthew Broderick. Oh, no, the uh, oh, the yes. time travel one or whatever. No, Project X is just your standard teen party movie, but found footage style. Is it a comedy? Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I guess I can't think of many found footage movies either that I, I found. Uh, you know, there amazing. was the the gallows. Didn't see the gallows. There was, uh, you know, open water. Oh, yeah, that wasn't good. I, it, which I found painfully boring. Yeah, it's a hard genre to make really pop. I, I thought they did it well with this. I thought it was I thought it was your typical hour buildup of of sort of building, building, building the suspense. And then they delivered with a half hour of really crazy shit, which I don't think most found footage movies do. Did you see? Cause I really, I really like Adam Wingard, and I think he's from the same school as like It Follows, where they're trying to, they're really trying to do a John Carpenter style of, of filmmaking. Why do you? What? But what makes you say that? Why do you keep saying John Carpenter? I mean, even the the credits of like the guest is, is like John Carpenter's credits okay. font. Like it's an, almost an homage to it. They feel very eighties. Okay. And he makes you know almost like a movie, a couple movies a year. It seems like he's, he's all right. I think they're trying. He's trying to emulate them. I, I like Wingard a lot, but he did the pilot for Outcast, which is the Cinemax horror show. Have you seen that? About the rap group. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no. You, you haven't seen that. No. No. I would like to see Outcast, folks. You know we're about to wrap this up. Uh, if you've seen Outcast, let me know if it's worth my time. Quarry on Cinemax is one of my favorite shows, and I haven't met a single soul who has seen that show. But Outcast is a horror series, so it might be good to talk about on this show. All right. Talking about future episodes, um, I'm gonna try to see the Bye Bye Man. The fact, like thinking about having to pay fifteen dollars for it here in L.A. is disturbing to me, but I'll do it. Well, and you can go uh, go go to a matinee, pay eight. That's true. But man, um, oof, what a smoking pile of shit it is. But people, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people have asked, "Is your next one gonna be uh, Prisoners?" And we've talked about it a lot. I asked Joe over this week to watch Prisoners. He couldn't do it. But I would say a pretty safe bet is that our next two will be Prisoners and The Bye Bye Man. If I see it. Uh, I can watch Prisoners on my own. I just couldn't come over to watch it that one night. That's fine. I mean, to me, Prisoners is a fucking masterpiece. I'm tipping my hat on that. But uh, if you haven't seen it, watch it, and then you can really enjoy that episode when it comes out in a week or two. Well, also let us know, too, if you have any interest in this, because I truly want to do Silent Night, Deadly Nights, part parts two, three, oh, I'd love it. four, and five. So as viewers, let us know if you have any interest. These fucking things get so crazy. I yeah. mean, the first one is nuts. The second one is even crazier. The and you watched two? 
Oh yeah. Then I'll borrow two for me tonight and watch that. Two is a two is a fucking romp. Yeah, I'll watch that one. Yeah. So um, and plugs. Uh, my special comes out February third, Comedy Central at midnight. Not the TV show at midnight. It premieres at midnight. Uh, you let me down. Replace February fifth, one a.m. and uh, hits the internet for download. Uh, also the album version, February seventh. Uh, I, w- I will be on the Gilmore Guys podcast next week. It is four hours of us discussing an episode of Bunheads, which no one has seen. I will say that there's a lot of really funny shit in there, but uh, you can check that out. That's all I really got. Um, oh, and I'll be at the Oklahoma something casino. <laughs> I don't have it in front of me. February 4th, I'll be at a casino in Oklahoma. You, you can find it. You, you just yeah. Google me. You'll, you'll find it. All right. All right. Folks, as always, we love your uh, your tweets and your feedback. I, if, if we don't respond to everyone, we are seeing them and taking them into consideration. When we slap a like on it, it means A, that we're seeing it, B, that we're liking it, and C, that we're like talking about it as something we're going to incorporate into this show. There are big things coming for this show in the very near future that we're excited to share with you. You can find me at the Patrick Walsh on Twitter and Instagram. You can find Joe at Joe DeRosa Comedy on Twitter and Instagram. You've been listening to We'll See You in Hell. It's a presentation of the Fangoria Podcast Network. It's produced by Thomas DeFeo and executive produced by the great Ken Hanley of Fangoria Entertainment. For press opportunities, advertising inquiries, and information about We'll See You in Hell, contact Ken at Fangoria.com. Folks, thank you very much. Keep those five-star ratings coming. We love you. Talk soon.